Welcome the Adobe EVP, Mr. Brad Rencher. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I, um, I have the pleasure of moderating this next section, which I'm very excited about. But before we move to that, as an ex one of the executive board members of Silicon Slopes, I just want to add my voice to what you heard yesterday from um, many of my friends and peers, which is that it's a special time to be here in technology in the state. Um, what we're building, um, the opportunity to master new markets and create new categories, um, it's an opportunity that's in front of us. And it's gonna, we will require us as a state and as a community to, I think, behave differently. Because we've had these moments before um, in the past. And I, th I really think it's going to take a commitment to sustained excellence. And you've heard many of the topics over the last few days. And I want to introduce a, uh, a speaker um, who I believe over his career has shown that he can master the, and, and really drive that sustained excellence to create new categories and master new markets. So let's queue up a video and then we'll welcome up Adobe CEO Shantanu Narayan. Ladies and gentlemen, Shantanu Narayan. We're headed right up here. Okay. They want you on the far left. So, um, Shantanu, welcome to Silicon Slopes. It's good to be back uh, in Utah, Brad. Thank it's, you for uh, having me. It's one. Um, it you know maybe we actually start with um, with uh, with Utah and uh, and Silicon Slopes and. You know, it's interesting, you did something eight or nine years ago that, um, that uh, many people hadn't done, and that was, as a CEO of a, of a, of a, um, a large technology company, you acquired a business here in the state, and then you made a decision to do something different, which is not to take all the jobs back um, to the Silicon Valley or somewhere else, but you, um, you stayed, and you invested, and you grew. Talk a little bit about um, you know, that decision, you know, your view on what's happening here at, in Silicon Slopes. Well, first, uh, I think Adobe wouldn't exist without uh, Utah. A lot of people may not know, I know you know this, but uh, one of our co-founders, uh, John Warnock, went to high school here, he went to college here, and actually at the University of Utah had the idea to start Adobe. So Adobe's uh, history with Utah is actually, uh, it precedes you and me, Brad. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, so it's Olympus High School, John Warnock attended Olympus High School and um, University of Utah, the, the College of, the, of Engineering at the University of Utah has his name on it. So still great ties to the, to the state. So talk a little bit about, keep, keep going on, on Utah. Well, Adobe at that point, this was uh, about 2008, 2009, and uh, there were two things that I think characterized the company at that point. We were incredibly well known for everything that we did with uh, digital media, you know, Photoshop and Illustrator and uh, you know, all the video products. But we found that we were artificially uh, lowering our aspirations to only think about content management. And there were two assertions as part of our strategic planning that we thought about. We said data was going to be important and that we thought that targeting the marketer in the enterprise uh, because HR was automated, supply chain was automated, finance was automated. We thought that automating marketing, bringing together art and science would be important. And uh, you know, Adobe is in the intellectual property business. I mean, what we do is uh, you know, we, we find great people and build businesses. And we were looking for companies that we thought would be the best company to launch us into this digital marketing space. And I remember when we first met and Josh and you know, the conversations that we had associated with where we wanted to go, we clearly saw that you know, in order to springboard Adobe into being uh, what we are now, which is the undisputed leader in digital marketing, we had to find people who had a real unique point of view and a passion around creating the business. I think the business at that point was something like $250 uh, million, $300 million. You know, this year it'll be two and a half billion, which is 10x of that. And you know, so we, we, we saw a really unique uh, insight into the business. We saw a talent that we thought you know, would, had a passion for being winners and leaders in this category. And uh, I'll embarrass you as well. I mean, we saw leaders like you who had the ability to you know, say, let's take us there. And so it's been phenomenal. I mean, our investment, when you look at you know, the building that we have in Lehigh, we've just announced we're actually dramatically going to expand. We go to where the talent is. It's as simple as that. 
and, um, and maybe pick up, you know, pick up there, and you, you talked a little bit about the, um, the, the investment here in the state. That's not where it stops. This weekend at Sundance, um, there's a bunch of things that are going on. Tell us about that. Well, Adobe has always been about art and science, and you know what better art than uh, what happens at Sundance, right? I mean, if you think about the history of the company, uh, we were formed when we said it's really critical to democratize, uh, you know, the ability for anybody to tell a story. That used to happen in print. That was the genesis of the company. Now that happens in video, and you see these unique individuals who have a story to tell, who want to express themselves through video and what the internet has made happen is that anybody with a great idea can actually transmit that all around the world. What better place to do that in Sundance? So to your point, uh, John's on the board. We've always been a, a big supporter of Sundance. I think we're gonna announce that, you know, the new next generation of directors, uh, how we encourage them to do it and we have a program in conjunction with Sundance and promoting women directors. So. Yeah, you're right. I mean, the association of Adobe and, and Utah go in many, many different directions. So, Shantanu, let's maybe um, pivot and talk a little bit about you. Talk a little bit about what Adobe's all about. And Adobe is a tech company that has a product that has become a verb, Photoshop. You, you, you'd mentioned that. And, um, and it, so we have, you have these wonderful brands that are out there. Um, what's, what's, what is the core and the genesis and, that, and uh, the... the the, really that, that core essence of what Adobe is and what are, we, what are we about today? Yeah, the mission of the company has actually remained relatively steadfast since the company was founded. Uh, we say we want to change the world through digital experiences. And I, I, I mean, if you're a tech company, you have to change the world in some dimensions. So, you know, uh, digital experiences seems as good a dimension as anything else. But there are two parts of the business. Uh, we say we want to empower people to create and we want to help businesses transform. And the empowering people to create is just, if you think of the new media types that are emerging, if you think about, uh, again, everybody who has a story to tell, whether it's through print or web or mobile applications or augmented reality or virtual reality, we want to build the world's best tools, systems, services, community to enable that to happen. I mean, it's crazy in this day and age that you, know, you draw with a mouse. Uh, the fact that you can't talk to these computers and express your own idea and you know, have the computer speak on your behalf. So we think it's the golden age of creativity. Everybody talks about STEM. We love to talk about STEAM because I think the world without arts and creativity would be a boring place. So that's a big part of what Adobe does. Thank you. And certainly on the other side, there isn't a business in this world that's not gonna get disrupted. Uh, by technology. When we think about, you know, every, you say this a, a lot better than I do, but everybody automated the back office, then people automated the front office, and now we think every business, whether you're in travel and hospitality, whether you're in airlines, whether you're in financial services, the digital experience that you deliver to your customers is going to determine whether you're in business, whether technology is a tailwind or a headwind. And our job in that particular space is, how do we help every one of those companies move their business online? How do we help them to create an engaging relationship with their customers? And we think that's the largest enterprise opportunity that exists right now. And you touched on some of these fundamental technology trends that are out there, whether it's, you mentioned AR, VR, you know, AI. Um, you know, from and your view as a, as a um, leader of a top technology company, um, what, what are the fundamental trends you think are shaping the future? Yeah, it's, it's always interesting sharing this because the reality is a lot of what I'm sharing with you, Brad has actually been uh, the architect uh, with us of a lot of these. But the two things I think we talk about, Brad, uh, a lot, which I think is key, is if every business in the world were able to take all the interactions that they had with every customer, and look at that and say, all that data that I have of anybody who stayed with me or traveled with me or done banking with me, and put that as an asset on your balance sheet, what would that be worth? And I think it's our assertion that that would be worth more than the company itself. And so thinking about how we unlock the power of all those digital interactions to deliver better customer experiences, uh, that's just an incredible opportunity. And I think the second thing we talk about is 
you know, Moore's law was all about computing. And it said that computing, uh, you know, the sort of exponential uh, rise of computing. And now we talk about if the experience that you deliver isn't as good as the experience that a customer is delivering, even if it's in a different industry, uh, you're in danger of running extinct. And so e enabling companies to do that, I think it's big. And, you know, software goes through these massive transformations, and people talk about whether it's artificial intelligence or machine learning or deep learning or neural networks. You know, the, the really interesting story is, as you know, people spend decades writing an incredible chess program, and the grandmasters, the ability, every grandmaster that was practicing would try and compete with the chess program. We now have the ability with artificial intelligence where you can write a program that has zero knowledge of chess, and within four hours, it beat every other decade-long program that was created. So artificial intelligence and machine learning is going to just change every part of technology. You, you talked about creativity a minute ago, and one of the things that you often get asked is, are the machines going to, is there any room for the human you know, mind and creativity in the, this machine-focused world? Well, I, you know, luckily, I think in my generation, uh, you know, there'll always be place for human ingenuity, and you know, I think creativity will always be more important. But I think you just look at the rapid pace that's happening. I, I think people and the hypothesis and the assertions will always be key. I think what computers will do will automate that faster and faster. But I, I, I don't think, uh, at least in the foreseeable future, that anybody is going to recreate the creativity that exists in the human mind. Great. Um, t talk a little bit about AR, VR, what, the, what you see um, in, that, in that world, you know, what Adobe is looking to do there. I think when you think about what's happening in AR, which augmented reality and virtual reality, I mean, the whole idea is how do you use computers and the medium that we have to deliver dramatically different experiences, you know, whether you're sitting in your living room, whether it's in education. You know, I, I tend to think that virtual reality will emerge first with more specialized use cases, uh, but augmented reality, because everybody with a smartphone now has the ability to create this different immersive experience. So I think where Adobe is looking at is, you know, sort of three things. The first is all of our leading tools. How do our leading tools understand that augmented reality is another output medium, just like we did when the web came along or mobile applications or screens? I think we're looking at general purpose, I mean, specialized applications as well for augmented reality. And the biggest thing that we focus on, as you know, is how do we deliver new services and one of our key goals is harnessing the, you know, collective intelligence that exists. We think AI, but harnessing the power of computing. There are tens of millions of people who use our products every day. There are hundreds of millions of assets that are being created in our products every day. If we can learn from that what somebody wants to do and help them accelerate that process of creation, I think we can deliver value. And um, one, you know, one thought as you're, as, as you're riffing on these technology trends, you saw, you, you talked a little bit about this in the context of Silicon Slopes and the acquisition of Omniture. But you've, you've been CEO of Adobe now. You're celebrating your 20th anniversary at Adobe overall. Been CEO for, um, you know, over half that, right? 10 years, yeah. 10 years. Um, and Adobe 10 years, um, at, 10 years later um, is a very different company. Uh, and you talked about the acquisition of Omniture to do that, but even the core creative business is different. Would you talk a little bit about what, what you saw there and why the change in this kind of transformation of fundamental business model and innovation? I, you know, I think if you're in tech, and if you're in tech and your business strategy is to preserve the status quo, you're doomed. And I think in 2009, we clearly saw that while people were using our products, we weren't innovating at a fast enough pace. And you know, at our core, we're a product company. And uh, in 2009, revenue growth was slowing. And we just thought that there was a better opportunity to deliver all this innovation through the cloud. Uh, you know, we, we had 12 and 18 month traditional product cycles. And so everything was predicated around not talking to our customers because heaven forbid you talk about what you're, wo what you're focused on and nobody's going to buy the existing product. And so I think we were the first company uh, who said, we're going to completely move from shipping boxes in a channel 
to delivering all of our software through the cloud. And not only were we going to do that to enable innovation to happen at a faster pace, but we were going to completely transform the business model. So in, instead of recognizing all that revenue up front, we would recognize it as people you know, subscribe to the offering, something that now is taken for granted. But as you know, in order to do that, we actually had to reduce our revenue by 25%, and we had to reduce our earnings per share by 65%, which as a public company, that's hard to do when you're reducing revenue by a billion dollars and when you're uh, telling the street, trust us. Um, luckily, it worked, which is why I'm here to tell you the story. Uh, otherwise, my successor would be telling you what a brain-dead idea that was. Uh, but I, I think the message for us and the learning is you've got to constantly change what you're trying to do. And it was the same with Omniture, which is we saw this unique opportunity, we said data was going to be important, and we said, you know, I mean, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. We had the recession, expectations were a little lower for the company, so what's a better time to go, you know, plan for the future? And it's one that, um, your 20th year at Adobe, your, t uh, your 10th year as CEO, it's been, um, it's been a record, last year was a record year. Like every press release that you, you know, the company sent out was record revenues, record ARR, record stock price, um, record market cap, $100 billion market cap. Um, you know, that's up about five times in just in the last decade. And have, you know, do you feel like, how do you measure success as a CEO? And do you feel like, hey, look, look at all those things I've arrived. Like, how do you, how do you think and feel about that? You know, when I think about legacy, I think about two things that really motivate me. I mean, the first is impact. And, you know, when you sit on a plane next to somebody and somebody is talking about, aren't you the Photoshop company? And, you know, uh, Photoshop has changed my life and, and the way I can now do things. Or, you know, the other question we typically get asked is, oh, your PDF. Why do I have to update PDF as often as I have to update? But, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I do think about impact. And impact is incredibly motivating in terms of, you know, uh, what we do. And the second thing we, we really think about is, you know, I, if you think about your different uh, stakeholders, uh, customers is that stakeholder, which is are you having impact? And then you think about employees and are you saying, are you creating a culture and a place where people can grow and do their best work? I mean, and, you know, th that's something that's really important to us. I think it's something you would acknowledge uh, differentiates Adobe from other companies. I mean, uh, you know, you go uh, visit the Lehigh campus and look at, you know, uh, what a unique culture it is. And so, you know, I, I think core values remain the same, but the culture has to keep changing. So I think about that a lot, which is, is it a place where people want to come and do their best work? Because that's what we do. We are custodians of the intellectual property, which is people. And if they do their best work, then your job and my job is actually easy. It's, it's interesting that, you know, you really think about what a company is, that sum of the intellectual property, it's almost that it's the sum of all the decisions that have been made in the history of the company. And that's what you end up, end up doing. And, you know, but you, at times you have to go back and revisit some of those decisions. So as you think about your own career and you connect the dots, was it always projected to be, you know, CEO of a top company? Like, is that the, always the trajectory? Like, what did you want to actually do with your life? Well, I wanted to be a journalist. My mother was a professor of American literature, and I used to, you know, edit the school magazines and all. When I grew up in India, and I grew up in India, uh, you know, most people said you either have to be an engineer or a doctor. And so, uh, and the sight of blood made me squeamish. I couldn't stand the sight of blood. So Doctor's out. Uh, a doctor was out, so I became an engineer. I guess vicariously, I'm still participating in the publishing industry, right, and, and in writing. But... You know, then I, I fell in love with computers uh, much, much later. I love what Aaron said earlier about, you know, enabling computers for everybody. I mean, digital literacy, you know, it used to be when we grew up, it was reading, writing, and arithmetic, and now digital is as much a part of that. But I, I love the business of technology. You know, I knew I didn't like research and technology, but this impact, and it's been an incredible ride. Like a lot of people in the audience, I was an entrepreneur. I started a company called Pictra, okay. and uh, that was in 95. We thought image sharing would be important in 95. There was no business model then, so you know the technology was great, but as part of that, I met Adobe, and because Adobe had Photoshop. So I've been in tech all my life, worked for some great companies, and uh, you know, it's blessed. So talk about your experience as an entrepreneur. There are a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, 
um, out here. What, what was your experience and, you know, and how do you piece that together in your career? You know, I, I think the, the phenomenal thing about entrepreneurship is you basically don't take no for an answer. And I think, as, as you know, Brad, we, we tend to think about how do we get that in a large company and how do you scale that, you know, sort of passion for making something that never happened, happen. Um, but I, I think being an entrepreneur, the best thing that I remember was, I mean, you do everything. You do everything from, uh, you know, being the office manager and ordering computers to uh, raising money to, you know, uh, and, and that, that, that joy associated with having a, you know, sort of, touching everything in, in the world and w was phenomenal. So I, I had a thoroughly enjoyable time. I, the thing, though, that I also realize is that you all start companies and you want them to become large companies, right? I mean, the whole, like, you know, every business starts as a $0 billion business. And so the question is, how do you take that entrepreneurship spirit? Yeah. And, you know, I like impact and I like, you know, we're a global company. We do business in 180 countries. So I, I think the trick for entrepreneurship is how do you have a really unique point of view? How do you s never take no for an answer? And then how do you scale it? And nowadays I think a lot more about scaling uh, because in companies it's really large. When you're a large company our size, how you encourage, incubate new ideas um, is one of the things, you know, the, I, the I think The antibodies about. often come out. The antibodies um, come out a lot, yes. Um, one thing, you know, you are, um, you know, from a CEO standpoint, you came up through the product and engineering ranks. You're an, you, you know, you ran engineering groups, you, you, you were an engineer, and then scaled to become a CEO running the whole business. As a, as a product CEO, how do you um, delegate? How do you know when to get into the details, um, when to go broad, be high level? Like, how do you balance that to, just from a leadership standpoint? Is this feedback that I'm getting in front of 10,000 people that sometimes I dive no, too deep, no, no. Uh, Brad, or you know? <laughs> no. It's just a question that someone submitted. I, I, I love product. I love product, and I think you know, there's elements of you know, the product innovation process that for me is the most enjoyable thing. I mean, John Warnock, whom we talked about, uh, John always told me if I don't like my job, I have one person to blame. And he didn't mean him, he meant me. And so, you know, I, I think where we spend our time is the most important thing. I, there are many areas that I delegate completely, uh, but product's an area of passion for me. And, you know, I, it's one of those areas where understanding it at the basic level, I, I think for me is a joy. So I, there's no question that as we scale, setting the right objectives and then getting the heck out of the way is how we, how we do what we do. But there are a few areas where I have been known to uh, dive a little deeper, and I'm, I'm actually proud of it because, you know, I, I think it also makes me a little bit more approachable in the company, and I think that's an element of the company that we want to be. Uh, you talked about the impact of data, and data, you know, we talk about data decision making, and you hear a lot about that. Um, what's your balance between making decisions based on hard data versus gut, gut feel? I, I think the best companies, and I think, you know, what's real challenge right now um, is how do you mirror the gut and hypothesis with the data? And in business meetings with me, if somebody comes in and all they are doing is spewing data, I'm like, that's all great, but tell me the story. Tell me the essence. Tell me the zen of what you're trying to tell me. And conversely, if people just say, this is my hypothesis, but they don't have the data associated with it, it's hard to, you know, understand if that's really taking traction. So. I actually think the best is when you have a really simple story. If it's a 20-page PowerPoint about an idea that you have, you know, at some point people are going to gloss over. But like you said, we said data was going to be important uh, eight years ago, nine years ago, and you know that's played out. We said marketing was going to be important and, and online businesses. So I think for entrepreneurs, having a really simple Zen statement about what they are think about and then constantly looking at data to understand, hey, is the data validating my hypothesis? Because if you're in denial of that, then you're also probably not going to be a good manager. So I think, I, I think one has to figure out how to blend it. One, um, maybe this, um, this question, um, you've heard at the conference as we were here this morning, um, one of the fundamental challenges facing the, uh, the state and the technology ecosystem is that around diversity and building diverse teams. 
Um, how do you think about that, you know, running, you know, a large technology company? It's pretty simple. In this day and age, if you can't have, your customers are diverse. And if anybody thinks that you can deliver great products to a diverse set of customers without having a diverse employee pool, you're, again, I'm, I, you're, you're denial. And so we just think about it, you know, whether it's women and saying, how do we make sure we get 50% of the talent that's out there, you know, feeling excited? Um, I know there was some conversation about it. We didn't come out and say we make 99 cents to the dollar. We said we make a dollar for a dollar. And Adobe accomplished pay parity across the world, which is something that very few companies do. So I, I just think it's... Thank you. It's just, it's great business. And you have diverse customers. You have to have a diverse employee base. And how you ensure that people's ideas are understood and rewarded and recognized and flourish that's what's going to separate the great companies from the not so great companies. So Shantanu, last question. You are, um, you're halfway through your tenure at Adobe. <laughs> um, you're 20 years in, in another 20 years, what do, you want the, what do you want Adobe to be and what do you want Shantanu's legacy to be? Well, I, I don't know about 20 years, so I'll start off by saying that. But you know, I, I just want to continue to f say that Adobe has made a difference in this world. And I think we have this unique ability. I mean, think about it. The print and publishing industry wouldn't exist without Adobe. You know, the web as we know it today wouldn't exist without Adobe. Documents and sharing wouldn't exist. And if we are constantly inventing the future, and if I leave this company in better place with, you know, people who are going to take it to a high level, I think it would be incredibly successful. Well, Shantanu, thank you for joining us at Silicon Slopes. Ladies and gentlemen, Shantanu Narayan. Thank All you. right, ladies and gentlemen, Brad, Shantanu, Adobe, both of you, thank you so much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we got...